Guys, welcome back to Mark Anthony's Music Picks, episode 13. Today's a really sad day. Uh, last night, I don't know if you heard, Mike Huckabee passed away. Really sad. I, I can honestly say that this is the first time in my life that I had a, you know, a DJ producer pass away where it really, like I tr really truly felt it. Mike Huckabee was one of the most legit, straight up characters in the scene. I was a purist. He ran his own label. You know, he cranked out all those monster tracks going all the way back to 1997, and his catalog is is just unstoppable. Uh, I'm I'm just really upset about it, and I'm I'm really sad that we're not going to get any new Mike Huckabee sets, no new remixes, no new you know synth 004. You know, it's just not going to happen. Um, so. You know, I love the guy to death and I want to show respect for him and do a tribute today by talking about, first I'm going to talk about a, a couple of his records that I really love. I'm going to do um, my favorite original, you know, Mike Huckabee track, uh, my favorite remix, and then I'm going to talk about the night that I got to see Mike Huckabee and actually meet him and, and go through that a little bit, kind of give you like a chronology. And I'm also going to uh, feature some of the records that, that came into play that night. So uh, first off, my number one Mike Huckabee pick, if, if you're going to buy one, is the Versatility EP on Synth. And the track, the, both tracks on this are good. The Sandcastles track, I, I've heard played out and it's really nice. But the, um, the M1 flashback, or I'm sorry, flashbacks from the M1 is the Beast. This is actually a 1997 track that got re-released on synth. It, it originally came out on a label called M3, and I think it was, if not, it, it might have been Mike's first record, if not um, one of his first, and it's under the alias uh, Roland King. I think it's the only alias that he had, but really, uh, really huge stompy kick drum and uh, some really unique out sounds and, and, and elements going on in that, and it just, um, just has that real like warehouse kind of like stompy, real punchy kind of kick vibe to it that Mike Huckabee's known for. Uh, his tracks just freaking go off and you know, they're, he's known for that peak time. I mean, he also has that deep house side that he had to him, but um, this, is, this is where it's at, man. If you, if you don't have any Huckabee records, start with this one. Next up, my favorite Huckabee remix of all time is one that doesn't seem to get a lot of love on Discogs is the um, Vladislav Delay Recovery Idea Remix. I'm just gonna like spin this up a little bit for you. This is on Semantica and there's two versions of this. You can get the four tracker and I look, there's a couple of these available for about 12 bucks. You can also get the original single-sided. It was like a 45 RPM part of its own series, part one, two, and three, and part three was the Huckabee Remix. Uh, none of those for sale today. You know, I don't know if people bought them up hearing about Mike's death. Uh, but this track, it sounds like the, the main element is like this like video game kind of like Detroity weird video game sound. I don't know how to describe it, but if you listen to it, you'd be like, wow, that's really unique. And of course, you know, Mike's stomp fest going on behind it. Um, so really unique. I, I never got to play this out to a crowd, but I I, I just I'm waiting for the right time to do it and I think it's like it's gonna be one of those things where it goes off and like two or three people are like what the F was that so um, Vladislav delay recovery idea Mike Huckabee synth remix total storm so now I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit about the night that I met Mike uh, because it was pretty epic night so Doombot and I were uh, clubbing partners back then and this is September 30th 2012 you can look up, I'll, I'm actually gonna put a link to the uh, resident advisor flyer for the party down below along with all the you know all the links to the discogs uh, releases that I'm gonna talk about so you can check out the original flyer but the card for that night September 30 2012 it was Joseph 
followed by Ripperton and then Mike Huckabee to close it, which is a pretty strong lineup. And the venue was a place that isn't around anymore. I don't think it even was open for that long, but it was called the Hudson Terrace. So Doombot and I hop in his car. We, you know, we're from Philly, so we head out to the to the Trenton train station, take NJ Transit all the way up the Rickety Transit line up to Penn Station, and then I think from there, I think we're excuse me, I think we we're just walking around New York City. I got I remember like we stopped and got sushi at this really sketchy place, and I was like, man, I hope this sushi doesn't go rogue on me because it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a long afternoon sitting in the sun if my stomach's all messed up, but. That turned out okay. And I think we got to the venue like too early. I think the party started at like two. We got there at four and the, the club wasn't even supposed to close until like four in the morning. So it was already like gonna be a long day. So we listened to a couple of the, the local New York guys play in the daytime. They were like okay, but not that impressive. It seemed like they didn't really know how to play for the context. Um, Joseph came on, he played pretty well. And you know, I remember getting a couple ideas from Joseph you know he was pretty cool and then at i would say maybe like 10 o'clock nine o'clock ten o'clock ripperton comes on now just to set the scene for you hudson terrace had a retractable roof over it and it opened up and they had a purple light like shining up from the floor onto the wall projecting like hudson terrace in big letters on the building next to it and if you went out away from the retractable roof, there was like kind of like a, a place with like, that was all windowed in on, on like three sides or maybe two sides, I can't remember, where you could like sit on the couch and look out over the Hudson River. And I remember like the aircraft carriers and the battleships and the, you know, the, all the old school boats were just docked there. And I remember thinking, oh, this is really cool. So it was a really sweet venue, like all wooden floors, just really kind of like had that like intimate kind of lounge vibe and being September 30 you can imagine the the weather was pretty optimal like I don't know, 60 70 degrees so it was just a good night to be there it just seemed like forces were all converging so Joseph set and winds down and Ripperton comes on right but he starts from dead silence he doesn't mix into like a Joseph thing and it's not it, it wasn't like oh oh Ripperton's on I didn't notice it he, that music was off for a couple of minutes. He was up there fiddling around, getting all his stuff set. And he launches into his set with uh, this record here. This is on Philomena, Philomena. And this is the Global Communications remix of 807, which is a classic ambient track from like the mid to late 90s. Uh, so I didn't know what it was, right? Ripperton made an edit of this with a kick drum and some like some percussion that just came like like rolling in maybe at like 110 112 beats per minute like he played it like like slow just to like kind of like set the tone and make a point and Doombot started bugging out because he knew he was very familiar with the original album he was like obsessed with it in his younger years so when when this came on it like kind of blew his mind and I was standing next to him and he was like, dude, do you know what this is? And I was like, I don't know what it is. So he goes running up to Ripperton right in the middle of like Ripperton's first track. And it's like trying to get the ID from him. It was really funny. Uh, but this track just like, everybody was transfixed. I remember we were just standing there on the dance floor, like what the hell is happening? I didn't find out until later that this, this was like one of the first times that Ripperton had played it. I think he had just made it that month and word was getting around on the message boards that Ripperton in his gigs was starting out his sets with with this global communications re-edit that he did and just kind of like taking the, the club by storm so he dropped this this record here is freaking awesome if you look I don't know if you can see the texture but it, it's like it's kind of um printed it has it, it it's layered and, and and textured like it's not it's not perfectly flat um which really it's just really cool artwork. Um, this is hard to get. I got lucky. I got a deal right when the COVID thing started. I guess somebody needed some money, so they sold it on Discogs for like 70. But these generally go for 100 to 150. And I saw back in 2015, they were selling for 250 to 300. So there's a, but there's a reason. The reason is that that track is freaking awesome. And it was blowing people's minds all the way back in 2012. 
the crazy thing about this too is I ordered this back in the beginning of March and it didn't show up until today, uh, the day after I, you know, the same day that I found out about Mike's passing. So I thought that was, um, I don't know, I guess serendipitous might be the word for it. But anyways, check this out guys. So any, anyways, I don't, rem I don't have any other tracks to talk about from Ripperton's set, but he transitioned over to Mike but before he did, we I got to meet Mike Huckabee. I was standing at the back of the DJ booth, just kind of like watching Ripperton and dancing. And I noticed Mike was sitting off to the side and he had, you know, just like jeans and t-shirt and he was just sitting there chilling. Like he just had this really like uh, calm vibe. And I remember going over and like, I shook his hand and I was like, hey, like, you know, I really like your music. And you know, he was just totally chill. He was like, yeah, nice to meet you, cool. I was like, I hope you rock it tonight. You know, that kind of thing, like trying to get him fired up. So Ripperton finishes his set and now Mike comes on to close it. And a couple tracks into his set, Mike drops this one. Dennis Ferrer, Underground is My Home. I think it was the vocal mix. I had already had this record and I knew it. And it was really awesome to hear. This track has a very noticeable prominent bass line in it. Uh, it kind of comes out of nowhere. So um, it was just awesome to hear that that bass line come like rumbling through the speakers. And it was uh, kind of like set the tone for Mike's set. Like, man, he's going to bring it tonight. Um, so definitely, definitely check this out. I think this one's still um, pretty affordable. Underground is my home. I think it was the main mix. The one thing um, during Mike's set that I noticed was... This guy's playing all vinyl and I was like, holy shit, um, what, a, what a brave, what a brave way to play. I play only records and I know how stressful it is to try to play any kind of gig with all vinyl. I mean, just off the top of my head, let's see what can go wrong. One time I had a dust bunny just randomly land on my record and jump the needle all the way across it during a peak time set. And I didn't know what the problem was because it was dark and I couldn't see it. I've had dancers dance too close to the turntable and, and bounce the needle out of the groove because they were all like, you know, kind of like, like jumping in unison. And, you know, I'm not going to tell people to stop dancing. That would be insane. But um, there's all these like pitfalls that can happen when you play records. You can ha I've had needles. The last time I did a recording just a, you know, a few days ago, the needle broke in the middle of my set and I had to, I had to run over and replace the needle. I've had uh, records warp, and when you go to backspin them, you can't you can't cue it right because it, it it's it, it pops the needle out of the groove. There's just so many things that can go wrong. So I'm sure Mike knows that too. So what he was doing, he's using these pucks, and this is the first time I ever saw somebody use these. This is called disc stabilizer. I think it's like a couple hundred grams of just pure downforce. And what you do is you, you, you kind of get your, your record ready. And when you're ready to actually drop it into the mix, you kind of just plop this on. It has a hole in the bottom uh, where the spindle goes. And you don't have to worry about it scratching the record or messing it up or anything. You just kind of plop it on there. And if your record's not flat or if it's not perfectly flat, this kind of puts like a, as if you're just kind of pushing down on it gently and it'll, it'll flatten your record out. So if you're fighting any kind of, you know, feedback problems, like any, this this will make your club set a little bit easier. It's, it's not gonna save you from all of the vinyl pitfalls if you're playing out in a club, but this will somehow, some, in some regards, make you a little bit more reliable. So I started using these all the time and I've had great luck with them. I have two of them and I use one, you know, for each each turntable. So yeah, anyways, that was something I learned from Mike. A little bit of a tangent there. But another track that came up towards the end of Mike's set, you got a picture, he was like kind of building this thing up. And as he got to the end, he was playing the kind of sound that he's known for, that, that like stompy kind of like peak, peak time, you know, I don't, I don't, warehouse, you know, kind of music. And he dropped this one. This one is totally, I never heard of it before, and it was the George George Lane's Big Apple Circus Unabomber Unabomber's remix. And Mike, I, I asked him about it, and he says, you know, he he politely he was like, can you just wait to the end and I'll show it to you? And I, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So his set ends and he, uh, he let me take a picture of it with my camera and I came home and ordered it. But check this thing out. Mike had the, Mike had the full version, but I got the promo when I bought this on Discogs. I mean, this is from 1997. Look how cool this was. Like they gave you like a little info sheet, trying to get like a little hype sheet for it. And then also a feedback sheet where it says, um, you know, it's asking you for like crowd reaction, personal reaction, like, they wanted your feedback and you got to you got to like write them back and and let them know how it went after you played it. I thought that was so cool. Like you just don't see that anymore um, nowadays. So anyways, um, bringing this thing full circle, the night ends. Mike let me get the, uh, the picture that I need uh, of the record. And, you know, we said bye. And after that, I, I, I initiated a, a Facebook friendship with him. I remember messaging him and he always wrote me back. I thought that was really, you know, this guy's got so much going on in his life and he always responded to me every time. Sometimes I'd send him a track. Hey Mike, what do you think of this? What do you think of this record? This would go good in one of your sets, don't you think? And he'd be like, oh, I'll check it out. Or, he, you know, maybe he would like it. I don't, I don't know if he, if he ever actually went with some of the picks that I made, but I just thought it was so cool that he, he always got back to me. He was, he was very humble. Um, so still in shock that he's gone, you know, I, I just feel like the scene's worse off without him. Like we need, we need characters like him in the scene. So hopefully, uh, his spirit will live on and we can try to recreate his essence. Um, that's all I got for today. Thanks for listening and, uh, go out and buy a couple Huckabee records. Show that guy some support. Peace guys.